Welcome to the 24th Annual Distinguished Statistician Colloquium sponsored by Pfizer, the American Statistical Association, and the University of Connecticut. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our Yukon Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of Statistics, Dr. Deepak Day. Good morning. I am Deepak Day. Professor of Statistics at UConn, and it is really my great pleasure to welcome you at the 24th Pfizer Colloquium in the department and at the University of Connecticut. This Pfizer Colloquium began in 1978 at University of Connecticut stores under the leadership of late Professor Harry O. Posten, University of Connecticut stores, and Dr. David Salzberg, Pfizer Global Research and Development in Groton, Connecticut. In view of the historical importance of this project, this joint initiative has been continually supported by funding from Pfizer Global Research and Development in Groton, Connecticut, the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut, stores and the American Statistical Association. After Professor Poston's death in March 2002 and Dr. Salzberg's retirement from Pfizer, Professor Nitish Mukhopadhyay, my colleague here at UConn Statistics, and Dr. Naiti Ting, then at Pfizer, served as program leaders for the respective organization. Along with this featured guest of honor, two other distinguished statisticians are also normally invited. The featured guest of honor delivers a special lecture under the auspices of Pfizer Colloquia by distinguished statisticians in honor of Dr. David S. Salzberg. Then a conversation with the featured guest of honor and the other two distinguished statisticians is arranged under the auspices of conversations with distinguished statistician in memory of Professor Harry Poston. This colloquium series paused for six years, and then it was initiated last year with the generous support from Dr. Kandan Natarajan, Head Global Biometrics and Data Management at Pfizer, and Dr. Ron Wasserstein, Executive Director of the American Statistical Association. Today's colloquium is the milestone for us to host the 24th Pfizer Colloquium in our university. The generous support from Pfizer and AHA enabled us to invite Professor Grace Waba, one of the most distinguished scientists in the field of statistics in our campus, to deliver the lecture, along with discussions by two other distinguished statisticians and her former PhD students, Helen Zhao and Yun Kyung Lee. Due to the importance of this program, for current and future generation of statisticians, it is also enable us to videotape these events for the archive of the American Statistical Association. Again, thanks to Dr. Kannan, uh, Ron Warsestein from ASA, local committee under the leadership of Dr. Haim Barr, our administrative staffs, graduate students, and our conference center personnel for making this event happen. Thank you all for coming, and now I will request my colleague, Dr. Haim Bar, to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Grace Waba. Thank you, Deepak. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Grace Waba. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I uh, have to thank Pfizer and uh, the people at UConn for inviting me. And um, uh, don't I see that 10 minutes sorry. <laughs> I'm a little bit slap happy. I retired from the university after 51 years uh, at being the oldest person uh, at the university, and uh, so, and also a woman. Uh, which was rather unusual. And so I've been the recipient of a lot of attention recently, and it's very flattering, but 
Well, I don't, don't really know what to do about it. Uh, so let me tell you how this talk today. Uh, so the title is Pairwise Density Distances and Reproducing Colonel Hilbert Spaces and an Approach to Treating Personal Densities as Attributes in a Smoothing Spline ANOVA Model. Now, first of all, how many people here have seen a reproducing Colonel Hilbert space? Uh, 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 Helen at Yoon, the distinguished questioners later on, my husband. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. so, uh, so that's okay because basically uh, uh, reproducing Colonel Hilbert space is very important and I'm going to devote the first two-thirds of this lecture to try to explain to somebody who may never even have seen a Hilbert space what reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces are. So don't let that put you off. Uh, then I will also talk, to, uh, talk about uh, smoothing spline and ova models, but yesterday in the rehearsal I ran out of time so I'll probably just uh, make just a few remarks about them. All right, so let's get on with it. Uh, this is a page turner. Oh, okay, so this, I call this the pre-abstract. Um, so Manny Parson was my thesis advisor, and uh, I gave a talk at the memorial session for him at JSM, and. Um, and this talk is a, a little bit of an expansion of that. And that talk is up on my homepage. And this talk, which I have a lot of references, will also be up on my homepage. You'll be able to find it. And uh, so it's fitting that I talk about Manny here because uh, Manny was the main speaker in the fi this Pfizer colloquium in 2006. And I was one of the discussants. So uh, I think. Uh, the pair of a uh, discussant and then the main speaker is a little bit unique in the history of uh, in the history of the, these colloquium talks. So next is a picture of us. Uh, so uh, in 2006, and believe me, when you get to be my age, you sure wish you looked like you did in 2006. And uh, there's a uh, Netus. Uh, and Joe Eaton, who is chairman of the uh, Statistics Department at Te Texas A, and at the same time, and that's Manny on the right, always smiling. All right, so here's the uh, abstract of the talk. So uh, where uh, my general interest is uh, involved in statistical model building, and by that I mean uh, uh, the, several, the simplest example of which uh, most of my time has spent on this kind of example, uh, where you're giving, a, you're studying either a clinical trial or the data from a clinical trial or a demographic study. So you have a, a, a population, a training set uh, that has lots of attributes and, 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 and one or more desired outcomes in this study and you want to build a model which will predict the outcome from the attributes. And uh, typical attributes in a biomedical study could be body age, gender, body mass index, uh, education, socioeconomic status, uh, prior heart attacks, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and as far as I know, nobody's considered the case where a sub each subject has a density or a sample from a density that's associated with them. So the, the idea of this talk is to use reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces, which she'll know, tell you all about, uh, how to take data uh, given uh, personal attributes in, say, a clinical trial or demographic study and combine them with other information that you might have, like uh, body mass index, as I said, and others of that nature, into a model to predict the outcome. All right, so the procedure, i just outlined it, but uh, is to, for each subject to embed their sample density into a reproducing Colonel Hilbert space. So 
I don't expect you to know what that means until I actually uh, show you how we do that. And uh, to use this uh, to get pairwise distances between densities. And, uh, and, and one of, this is Gray Suave's meta theorem, which probably goes back to Pythagoras. Or if you're trying to build a statistical model but, uh, given lots of relationships between subjects and an outcome, what really matters is the pairwise distance or the relative positions of all the attributes or all the people and so forth. The, uh, the relative uh, distances would be invariant under some kind of a translation or a rotation that uh, takes care of the units properly. So, uh, so if you have relative distances, then a pairwise distances, you can use these to build a model. And I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but one of, the pap one of my favorite papers that involved uh, several people and uh, a demographic study where um, we had pedigrees where a third of the people in the study had relatives in the study. And so we knew um, who was, we knew all the pairwise distances of people in terms of the expected number of shared genes, like siblings would, would be one half, uh, pa grandparent and grandchild would be one quarter, and so forth. So we could translate pedigree distance, pedigrees into pairwise distances between members in the population. And in that study, we could um, uh, try to understand the differences between um, uh, family structure and uh, an outcome. And of course, there's the big issue of nature versus nurture, which is uh, to say how much comes from genes and how much comes from uh, behavioral things like smoking. And you can find out that smoking and body mass index and socioeconomic status also run in families. So I'm getting a little bit off topic, but the point is to be able to, so that's one example of pairwise distances. So if we're interested in, uh, in personal densities, we have to have a way of measuring distances between densities. And there are a lot of proposed methods for doing it. And uh, um, you can find, like Wasser sign distance and so forth, you can, you can find a lot of them. The one I'm gonna talk about is one based on reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces. So I better get on to uh, talk about the reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces. Once we get the pairwise distances, then we're still not finished. And we use something called regularized kernel estimation, which I'll tell you what that is. And then after we do that, we can um, put, we're in, we have the ability to put the results into a, a complicated multivariate prediction model or classification model. All right, so at first I'll start with an example of a personal density, and then I'll give a reproduction to a reproduction, sorry, an introduction to reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces. And uh, then uh, that's gonna be most of the talk. And then the part two will be personal densities as attributes. How we, step one is to use what I've just explained to you about reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces to obtain another way of getting pairwise distances between densities. As I mentioned, lots of people have different ideas on how to do that, and this is one such idea. And step two is to use something to take the pairwise densities and map them into a low-dimensional Euclidean sp uh, space to, get, to use pairwise distances to get pseudo, what we call pseudo-attributes. And these are rare real numbers, which then can go into a prediction model a complex prediction one. All right, so, an, uh, so here, I'm starting with a, an example of a personal density. Uh, that came from this paper, a note on the probability distribution of the surface electromyogram signal, and the references uh, in the list of references in the paper. 
I shouldn't get on my home page. So a surface electromyogram signal is the electrical manifestation of neuromuscular activity uh, recorded at the surface of the skin. And the example is uh, a so-called trace at the abductor pollis brevis. What this is is the muscle that connects the thumb to the palm. And you get this thumb to do various things. And then you can, from that, learn something about the behavior of the muscle. And they are interested in this for people who have some kind of muscular control problems. They want to learn as much as possible about how this muscle works under various conditions, which is why they study this. So they restrain the person. The, the picture I'm going to show you has four plots, which come from one person whose muscular behavior is measured under four different conditions. And their hand is restrained. They measure the signal under four, four different conditions of activity. And then it's sampled at a 10 kilohertz, a very high, den high density sampling. And they take these samples and they construct a density using Parson kernels from it. So here's the example here. Four different signals under uh, four different uh, So here are the four different signals they've been sampling, sampled very finely. And they took all the samples and they constructed four different densities using a Parson estimate. Uh, and uh, so you can see that the four densities are different. And they tell you something about the shape. So uh, this is a periodic function, or appears to be periodic. And the densities will tell you something about the shape of these bumps. And uh, so you can see that they're different. So that's an example of uh, a personal density estimate. All right, so now here goes the introduction to reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So in its simplest forms, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is a simple general, is an infinite, gen, an infinite dimensional generalization of ridge regression in its simplest form. It's not the most general form, but I'm going to do that. So, le so let me tell you what ridge regression is, and I think this should be uh, somewhat uh, well known to most statisticians. Uh, so uh, we let y be a d-dimensional vector, and f be another d-dimensional vector, and we let sigma be a d by d strictly positive definite matrix. And we can define a square norm, a, a distance in this norm between f and g. So uh, we have 2D dimensional vectors. And we let sigma be a strictly positive definite d, d by d matrix. <clears throat> and you can define a square norm on vectors in Euclidean d space by uh, this notation uh, as uh, f of substitute sigma is f sigma inverse f transpose. And then the distance in this norm between f and g is f minus g. And I put the subscript sigma there. OK, so this defines a perfectly good square norm that has all the properties of inner products and so forth. All right, so now let the eigenvectors and eigenvalues be, of sigma be phi nu as the eigen, eigenvectors and lambda nu the eigenvalues. And so we expand the ijth entry of sigma in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So, so this is just the eigenfunction, eigenvalue decomposition of sigma. And we, we can rewrite the square num of f as the sum from nu is 1 to d, f nu squared divided by lambda nu, where f nu is just the inner product here. And if we suppose that y is f plus e, where e is white Gaussian noise, then the ridge regression estimate of f is the minimizer of residual sum of squares plus lambda times the, f, f, the norm of f squared in this sigma norm. 
over the domain of d-dimensional vectors. So this is a, a one example of ridge regression where the ridge penalty is f in Euclidean terms is f sigma inverse f transpose squared. So that's how some people do uh, ridge regression. All right. Now, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So the characteristic of sigma is a positive definite matrix, and so we have to define now a positive definite function. So instead of a domain of d-dimensional vectors, let, for example, be the domain of the unit interval. That's a very, very special case, a domain of the unit interval, but let t, let t be some domain and uh, 0, 1 are, is an example. Uh, it, so uh, another is the d-dimensional unit cube, the sphere, more complex domains, and so forth. And k of s t, s and t, is a strictly positive definite function. All right, so it's a strictly positive definite function if all finite sections of it are strictly positive. So k of t i and t j for any n and any a i a j, if that's greater than zero, then k is a strictly positive definite kernel. And I haven't said anything about the domain, actually. You can think of it as zero one if you want. And note, nothing is being assumed about the domain other than the existence of a positive definite function on it. So there are lots of domains where you can define a positive definite function. All right, so we start out with the famous moore arenshine theorem. Let script T be a domain in which a positive definite kernel K of ST for S and T is defined. Then there exists a unique reproducing kernel HK associated with K and vice versa. For every reproducing kernel Hilbert space, there exists a unique positive definite function K. Basic papers, Aaron Schein, in 1950. So I still haven't told you what a, an example of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is. So now we have to think of the following. We have to uh, look at K of ST. And now if we fix S and look at this as a function of T, then we have a function of T which will be in the space by construction, which I'm leaving out. So that's a function of t for each fixed s. And let this be the inner product. Now, this function of t has an interesting property. If you take any f and take its inner product with k sub s, it pulls out the function of f at s. It's called the representer of the function at s. So uh, this is the special property of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. If you have a positive definite function, uh, you can, uh, there will be a reproducing kernel Hilbert space associated with it that has a lot of properties. And one of them is that if f is in the space and you enter product and with k of s, it picks out the value of f of s. And furthermore, k sub s inner product k sub t is k of st. That's why it's called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And the square distance between f and g is denoted as f minus g in the norm of the, in the square norm of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So that so far looks like a generalization of ordinary ridge regression. And now here comes the Mercer theorem famous Mercer theorem. It says, let T be a compact domain. Okay, so that's a special case already, compact domain. And let K be a positive definite function on T. And suppose that K squared of S and T, DS dt, is a, some constant less than infinity. So the Mercer theorem says, that if that's the case, there exists an eigenfunction, eigenvalue expansion, just like we had in the finite dimensional case. We have eigenvalues and we have eigenfunctions. 
only the, the eigenvalues have to de decay sufficiently fast so that everything converges. So this is the famous Mercer theorem here. And so, and the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues is equal to c less than infinity. And if we now, if we, as an example, the phenu of s, if the domain is a unit interval, then the, the phenus are a complete orthonormal sequence on the unit interval, and they, we could take them as sines and cosines, and then the lambda nus have this property. And we let then f nu are the Fourier coefficients, and the squared norm of f in this case is just this formula, which looks just like we saw before in the ridge regression case, except that the sum is infinite, and the f nu squares, the Fourier coefficients, have to decay fast enough so that this sum converges. And in fact, Elements in the space will be f such that the Fourier coefficients decay fast enough so that this sum converges depending on what the eigenvalues are. All right, so, so far we have, if we have a compact domain, then uh, we have this eigenfunction, eigenvalue decomposition, and we have an inner product which looks like a simple generalization of the, um, of the ridge regression that I just did in finite dimensions. But we haven't said anything other than the dom anything other than uh, about the domain other than you can find a reproducing positive definite function on it, and it satisfies the condition of the Mercer's theorem, which says that you have a finite dimensional, I mean, you have an infinite dimensional sequence of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Uh, so that's in Riesnage. And, um, but that's not the most general case of uh, reproducing kernels and reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So, but to just go back a minute, in a word, if you're, if, for example, the unit interval, uh, if you take the unit interval um, and a certain set of eigenvalues, then you get that, that convergence of that sum is equivalent to, for example, the square integral of the second derivative of the functions. So uh, those of you who have seen a cubic spline, a cubic spline has square integral second derivative, and it's in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space of uh, 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 span by sines and cosines and functions whose Fourier coefficients go to zero at a rate uh, determined by whether it's a second or square integral, second derivative, or square, some higher order derivative. But more generally, uh, reproducing kernels can be quite different. For example, so called radial basis functions. So they depend only on the Euclidean distance between pairs of points. And the Gaussian radial basis function is the most common example. So here's the Gaussian radial basis functions. And uh, so this is very popular. Uh, this is Euclidean distance between s and minus t squared. So if we, if we fix s and look at this as a function of t, we get something that looks like a Gaussian. And it decays, goes out to infinity, but it decays very rapidly. So functions in this reproducing kernel Hilbert space are infinitely differentiable. And there's a big class of return radial basis functions, which is another useful class of radial basis functions. And they only depend on pairwise differences. So if we're going to start with densities, and we're going to convert our densities to pairwise distances, we only have, up to, we only have pairwise distances so we want to use a, we want to involve them with a reproducing kernel space that only involves 
pairwise distances, and that means radial basis functions. So for, for this particular kernel, we don't have a finite sequence of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. We have the norm can be expressed in terms of weighted values of the Fourier transforms as opposed to Fourier coefficients. So when we start using pairwise distances from densities in a reproducing kernel space setting, we have to use radial basis functions because we only know pairwise distances. All right. So the general penalized likelihood estimate with Gaussian data is we let y of i, so we're talking about functions now, and which we observe only discrete values. S smoothing splines are the most common manifestation of what I'm talking about, but I won't really have a chance to say too much about them here. Uh, so uh, we're given data y, which is the value of some function on some domain at some points, t1 up to tn, and, and contaminated by white Gaussian noise. And the penalized likelihood estimate f sub lambda, lambda is a parameter of f, in a reproducing Carl Hilbert space is the solution to minimize the residual sum of squares plus lambda times the norm squared of f. And lambda is, controls the famous bias variance trade-off. Anybody here familiar with the bias variance trade-off? Uh, I see a few. Okay, the bigger lambda is, the less wiggly you might say of f. If lambda is very large, it will compress the non-parametric part of f. It makes f smoother, so to speak, if you were dealing with a reproducing kernel space of square integral second derivatives, it would penalize the square integral second derivative. And that square integral second derivative on the unit interval is a very, very subjective way of saying it looks smooth. All right, so you have to choose the lambda, but the solution is the residual for Gaussian noise, y minus f sum of squares plus lambda times the norm of f. And there could be other parameters hidden inside, uh, inside f. Uh, but the big remark I want to make, I feel we'll make, we'll make a big thing out of it, is this is minimizing the residual sum of squares plus lambda times the sum of norm. Or norm. Uh, now if we replace residual sum of squares by, suppose we have Bernoulli data, we replace that by the log likelihood, then we have a penalized log likelihood estimate. So we have a, a normal, a, 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 a penalized version of the log likelihood. So if you want to estimate the log likelihood non-parametrically, this is the way to do it. And if, you're, if your norm is uh, square integral second derivative, uh, then the lambda will control the visual wiggliness of it. Now, for classification, what happens for classification? So the sum of squares is replaced by a sum of hinge, so-called hinge functions, or the kernel trick. We're finding a function to minimize the norm in some function space. But it says that uh, the representative theorem says the minimizer of this will be in the span of these k sub ti's of t. What are these again? We fix ti and we look at the positive definite function as a function of t. So that the rep, this version of the representative theorem is not the most general version, but it's a version, basic version. It says the minimizer of this expression is in the span of these. And that is true whether we put a log likelihood here or some other convex function there. All right, the purpose of this talk was to try to show you how you could use pairwise distances uh, in a personal um, 
uh, and, and as a personal attribute. But I think instead of, well, um, all right, I'm going to just run through this very quickly, and then I'm going to say some remarks about the hinge function and the relationship between statisticians and computer scientists, because I think it would probably be more interesting for you than seeing the details of this. So, um, but I just want to say, so we, the first thing we wanted to, wanted to do was to use per, using personal densities as attributes to embed the densities in a reproducing kernel space. So uh, you can always do that if you have a density and the sample version. Uh, and here's the sample version. Well, I'm just having trouble with this device. Uh, so the point of this so far is to show you that you can take sample densities and get a pairwise distance between them. And as I said before, it's not the only way of getting a pairwise distance, but it's a way to proceed in using them as personal attributes. Here is an example of between 280 protein sequences uh, obtained from pairwise alignment scores. So this is work with uh, Fan Lu and Sundas Kellis. Each protein, between each pair of protein sequences, it's mapped to uh, a computer code which uh, gives a measure a biologically reasonable measure of about how far apart the sequences are. They gave us pairwise distances of 200 pro 280 protein sequences, and they're mapped into a Euclidean space. And the problem was classification. There were four different kinds of protein sequences. All right, so I think that's all I'm going to say about um, using the, we get to this, uh, this stage with pairwise densities, and then we can, uh, this is a data rejection scheme, and then we can use them, use the cohort, the coordinates with other variables in a prediction model. But uh, let me go back now to that residual sum of squares, uh, the time plus lambda times the seminar. So that was the sum of squares. We could have used, um, the log likelihood for Bernoulli data, if we wanted to classify things, we would be estimating a probability. Uh, if we had two classes, we'd be estimating a probability that their subject was in class one. Now, suppose we replace this with a so-called hinge function, which I don't think I have a picture of. Uh, but the hinge function, if you do that, you get the support vector machine. Uh, the support vector machine is much beloved by computer scientists because it was, uh, ha had an amazing ability to classify. If you applied a multi-category support vector machine to those sequences I put up there, it would do a really good job of classifying them. But uh, nobody understood in computer science why. And I used to have a, a talks with Alvi Mangasarian, who was a computer scientist at Madison, and he was doing classification in some complicated way that I had no idea. And he would complain that statisticians didn't know anything about what he was doing, that they didn't understand him. I said, I don't understand what you're doing either, Alvi. And he says, well, I don't understand what you're doing. But we remained friends. Well, if you take the replace penalized likelihood by something called the hinge function, then you have the support vector machine. And this was a famous result in which my now colleagues, Helen and Yoon, who you will hear from, had a major role in this result with Yi Lim uh, it was one of those ser serendipitous affairs where the four of us were talking about uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, 
and, it, and the various subsets of the four, as Helen and you wrote lots of papers, that the support vector machine was estimating the sign of the log ratio. So if you had put Bernoulli data, the Bernoulli likelihood in there, you would get a probability estimate, a probability, you could derive that probability that, we were, that a subject was in class one. If you were uh, using a support vector machine, you would be estimating the sign of the log odds ratio. So in the simplest case, if the prior odds and the costs were equal, the log odds ratio would estimate uh, the, the a probability, and the support vector machine would estimate the sign of the log odds ratio exactly what you're supposed to do to, uh, to, to classify things according to statisticians. And uh, so there's a, sp a bunch of beautiful papers. Now, where did, the, so, any, any minutes left? One. So I'll tell this story. So there's a, and probably come out in the discussion later. There was a meeting at uh, Mount Holyoke uh, and Vladimir Vaknik, who invented the support vector machine, was there. I was there, and a whole bunch of other famous statisticians were there. And my partner, who is now my husband, actually was there too, because he was on a bike ride uh, through the countryside and decided to stop in and see what was going on. Thank you, David. Uh, and, um, and so uh, I, I talked about reproducing kernel spaces, and I showed an example and used the representative theorem to say that the solution is in the span of these basis functions and uh, the representers. And Vladimir Vapnik got up, and he had something called the kernel trick, where he starts out with some positive definite function, and he lands up saying that what it amounted, he didn't know it, but what it amounted to was expressing uh, the data involving the, the hinge function as a linear combination of these representers. And somebody in the back of the room said, hey, that looks like Gray Suave stuff. So it soon became evident in worldwide that the support vector machine could be obtained as a penalty functional method in reproducing kernel spaces by replacing the log odds ratio by the hinge function. So uh, well, I'll make a few more remarks to my colleagues, Helen and Yoon, also did some other uh, groundbreaking things. Uh, the support vector machine originally had to do with pairwise classification and if you had to try to classify things into four categories, for example, you do lots of pairwise uh, classification. You compare A against B or A against everything else and so forth. And um, they showed that the multi-category support for, there was a genuine multi-category support vector machine obtained while so solving a particular generalization of that penalized likelihood equation, which would estimate, uh, uh, the, which would, as, well, it would, um, it would classify, uh, do the multi-category classification of, uh, of multi-category data. So I'll end there.